Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions, brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here is Phil Mackesy. Gerald Salente is publisher of the Trends Journal, and he's founder-director of the Trends Research Institute. You can find out more at TrendsResearch.com. He's coming to us today from beautiful Kingston, New York. Gerald, welcome back to This Week in Money. Ah, it's great being back. Hey, turns out the Mayans were wrong. We didn't have the apocalypse, but we still have a hell of a mess on our hands, do we not? Uh, The fiscal cliff behind us today as we celebrate, cue the trumpets here, the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. Ah, I see. I feel so relieved. (laughs) Happy days are here again. Everything's going to be fine. You know, I have to tell you, Phil, you know, I've been in this business for over 30 years, and I've never seen a a year end like this one. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the presidential reality show here in the States, and I've never witnessed an election like this one where there was such little interest to begin with. And remember, you know, several million less people voted this time around. And it ended with a dud. In other words, there was no post-election pop. Instead, the D.C. drama queens and the Beltway (laughs) Circle jerks put fear and hysteria back in the minds of Americans. If you don't have terrorism to worry about, how about falling off a fiscal cliff? That'll scare the hell out of you. So what what they've done is they've created a situation here where it's become a lose-lose situation. They've done nothing with it to really fix the so-called fiscal cliff. All they've done is they've now they've done some tax rejiggering, but nothing that's really going to amount to much because the multinationals are still getting away with a free ride. You know, you have that place in the Cayman Islands of Bermuda, mm-hmm. you're still cool. And of course, the uh, you know they, they didn't soak the the Warren Buffetts and the and the Lloyd Blank fines and the multi billionaires, and and so what they did is just really it's more theater. As I said, this is the D.C. drama queens and the the Washington, the Beltway Circle jerks starring in the the soap opera called The Fiscal Cliff. Gerald, market rally today reminds me of my uh, whitewater rafting days. We're all cheering because we got through the rapids, and suddenly we realize, oh, my God, there's a waterfall ahead, and that's coming up in March. That's the debt ceiling, which is going to dwarf the fiscal cliff. Exactly. That's what I was saying. They really have done nothing. And what do we have? You know, we have $16.4 trillion You know, the, the United States is carrying in debt, and that's, of course, without all the liabilities attached to it. So, no, they didn't do anything, and they're not going to because they've avoided the biggest issues. And the biggest issues are the ones that I mentioned about taxes. I mean, you have hedge funds and in these so-called private equity groups and these vulture capitalists that are paying, you know, 15% tax rate. And, and that should, that's when you produce things. They're not producing anything. All they're doing is producing money for themselves. And, and so they're not creating anything other than personal wealth. That should be at about 39, 40%. I mean, all they're doing is doing deals. And then, and then there's the defense issue. You know, we've got countries to attack. We have drones to fly. <laughs> we have bombs to drop. Yeah. Don't stop any of that. We have, we have a trillion-dollar F-35 plane program that's going to enrich the military-industrial complex. Don't touch that. So they're not doing anything to address the real issues. Why not? I'm going to ask a dumb guy question here. Why aren't we talking about tax or, or re- entitlement reform here? Why, why, was, why were the Bananos, the Lanskys, the Dutch Schultz, and the Al Capones criminals? That's who they are. Yeah. Why is everybody afraid to call a spade a spade? You can call a criminal a criminal, a robber a robber, a murderer a murderer, a whore a whore, but you can't call politicians whore whores, murderers, and, and thieves, or, or one of each or all the above, that's who they are. Gerald Salente, our guest here on This Week in Money. We're looking at some of the trends we can expect to see uh, that we talked about last year that are going to continue to be uh, reported and continue to be news in 2013. Starting with the U.S. economy, here is a, a great quote from the Trends Journal from Fall. The American economy can't produce its own clothes and shoes or the manufactured products it consumes or its own energy 
all of which it imports by issuing more debt. And that's got to continue this year, right? Yes, and that's the only reason why there's any recovery anywhere. It's not only in the United States. They're printing this digital money not worth the paper it's not printed on. But they have names for it, white shoe boy names. In the United States, they call it quantitative easing. Mm. How's that for producing cheap money, bringing interest rates to record lows, starving savers because they have no place to put their money, but allowing banks to keep funneling it in. Let's go over to Europe. I got an idea. I got a scheme, Phil. We'll call it Elthro, long-term refinancing operation. How does that fit? I like that. You like that? Yeah. All right. Well, what that means is we'll give banks all the money they need. Don't worry about it. Pays back when you get it. And in the meantime, I came up with another one. We'll call it... uh, I got it. Uh, Ongoing monetary transactions. OMTs. How's that? (laughs) Everybody could use an OMT. Look what's going on in Japan. They just got a new prime minister, another El Presidente. And this guy, the first thing he did was he told the Bank of Japan, we need more cheap money like the rest of the world. We got to compete. You see the yen go down? Yeah, because they're printing more money. The only so our forecast for the economy of 2013 is more of the same but worse. So more money printing, but of course that's not going to spur economic growth at all. Of course it is. Don't you read fairy tales? <laughs> don't don't. I mean, can't you buy into stupidity? I guess I could. Yeah. Well, maybe if you get paid enough, then you'll say anything. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Gerald Salente here on This Week in Money and one of the other big trends uh, that we followed in 2012. The presidential reality show, it's over. Finally, U.S. voters picking the lesser of two evils. What is ahead for U.S. politics and President Obama? I, I can tell you that now that Obama won, the future is easier to read because people don't have very high expectations he really isn't all that popular. This, you know, this wasn't a, a runaway race. And the difference is, you see, if Romney had won, then the sheeple would have said, you know, give him a break. You know, give him some time. He just got in there. You know, give him a good two and a half years so he can really show how he's screwing up. <laughs> Let's not take him at face value, having promised nothing Let's see if he's going to deliver something. So, in other words, Romney didn't come up with anything. The cat came up empty-handed. But if he had gotten elected, Phil, people would have you know, deluded themselves into believing that he had a plan and he was going to pull it off. So you don't have that anymore. There's no illusion now. There's no hope, and there's no change you could believe in. We're talking to Gerald Salente about some of the trends we can look forward to or dread in uh, 2013. One under the dread column, I guess, would have to be extreme weather. We had a real bad one last year. 80% of the nation's corn crop affected the U.S. supplying nearly half the world's corn. We can pretty much expect that to be a no-brainer, that prices are going to go up around the world. Well, you know, people argue, is there global warming, is there climate change? You know, I don't even get into the discussion anymore. All I merely say is, listen, if you're going to dump trillions of gallons of poison into the earth, spew trillions of uh, pounds of toxin into the air, and dump trillions of tons of pollutants in the water. You think it's going to have an effect on anything? No. Well, you you should run for office. (laughs) (laughs) Of course it's going to have an effect. Exactly. And, And so, of course, it's going to have an effect. You're going to start seeing more and more extreme weather conditions. At the same time, we have massive population growth. Just to put this into context, you go back 100,000 years ago to 1900, It took all that time to put 1.5 billion people on the planet. Since that time, what have we added? About 6 billion people, 5.5 billion people in 100 years? So so the, the planet can't sustain it. So now we have two things going on. Yes, there'll be higher prices for food, but there's going to be shortages also. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the trends we're writing about in the New Trends Journal. And the shortage is going to be for safe foods, for clean foods, non-genetically modified, uh, non-herbicide, pesticide sprayed. There's going to be a real shortage of high-quality foods.
Gerald Zalenti, our guest here on This Week in Money, and one of the other hot spots we're going to be talking about in 2013, the Eurozone. German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, calling for patience in her New Year speech from Berlin, uh, says the crisis is far from over. You mean they haven't fixed it by dumping all this money in, into the system? They, have, they, they haven't fixed it by, by stealing money from the people and giving it back to the banks that made bad bets? You mean they haven't fixed it by driving the nations into depressions, which they call recessions, when you have unemployment in Spain and Greece at over 25% and youth unemployment around, what, uh, over 50% in many of the countries? Of course they haven't fixed it. These are the inepts and the incompetents. They are the relatives of the D.C. drama queens and the Beltway Circle jerks. They're politicians. One of the things we saw again uh, last year that we're going to probably see more of this year, worldwide protest uh, against business, against politicians, against corporations. Uh, as you phrased it here, a few people with a lot in control of everything and a lot of people with very little going out of control. That's got to continue this year. Well, it is. Again, we, I just mentioned about the austerity measures. You know, I, I mean, could you imagine just last week in Portugal, they... they they just added a 3.5% tax on anyone making over the minimum wage, plus other austerity measures in a country that's already in depression. Well, again, you know, the, you know, people talk about the new world order. There is a new world order. And, and it's not, you know, it's in front of everybody, everybody's eyes. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's the banking order. You know, as, as we're in Christmas time over here, just getting out of it, you know, I, I can mention the word Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> without people getting angry. <laughs> and, and I mention it because, think about it, Phil, that the only time the Prince of Peace becomes violent is when he picks up a whip to chase the money changers out of the temple. Mm-hmm. Nothing has changed since biblical days. The money changers just changed their name. When I was a kid growing up in the Bronx, they were called loan sharks. Now, of course, they're financiers, and, and they're taking over. I mean, think about how it must have been for the Prince of Peace to become violent, because the money changes were destroying the people. Guess what? They're doing it again. We're talking to Gerald Salente. We're talking 2013 trends. And here's another trend we can pretty much uh, uh, put money on. Anti-American protests spreading across the Middle East. Of course, the administration and the media blaming al-Qaeda. But the last time we talked, you said, hey, wait a second here. The real villain here is U.S. foreign policy. You know, Phil, we had this terrible tragedy here in, um, in December, the, the Newtown mm-hmm. massacre, this young kid. You know, obviously out of his mind, and who knows on what kind of prescription drugs like Ritalin or Prozac or uh, Zoloft. And by the way, since this whole spate of these mass murders committed by young men has happened, they've all been on these drugs. We don't know what this guy's been on because they're holding it back. But this never happened before. So when you listen to the commercials, you don't have them there up in Canada, but they pump drugs in this country with these moronic commercials continually. And at the end of them, they'll say things like, and, you know, extended use of this drug may cause suicidal tendencies. So what we're looking at, and I'm mentioning going back to what we're talking about, this is a culture of cruelty. You want to talk about mass murder with guns? How about starting wars against innocent people like the Iraqis for fake reasons, killing, what, a million of them, spending a trillion dollars, and sacrificing the limbs and lives and minds of our soldiers to do so? By the way, there are some 26,000 Iraqi and Afghan veterans that are homeless in the United States right now. So what the United States is doing, it's continuing... It's wars around the world, whether it's predator drones into Pakistan, into Yemen, into the Sudan, into Afghanistan, whether it's now the spreading of 35 countries, the Africa com, AFRICOM, the new, the new uh, Pentagon ruse to go into Africa and stop those terrorists from spreading throughout, and in the process, you know, killing how, who knows how many. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get blowback, and it's going to blow back into the United States. 
And when it happens, the people will say, as they said before, why did it happen? Oh, little girls and boys, because they hate our freedom and liberty. One of the uh, events we thought would happen in 2012 may happen in 2013. The first great war of the uh, 21st century, most likely Israel against Iran over nuclear weapons. Israel has nukes. Iran wants them, and the Israelis are on our side. They're the good guys, and the Iranians, of course, are the bad guys here, right? Of course. And uh, it's bigger than that as well. You look around, I mentioned what's going on in Europe with the indignados, millions of them taking to the streets throughout Europe in protest for the austerity measures. In the old days, that was called class warfare, and it's happening. As I mentioned, far too few have much too much, and way too many have much, have much too little. And when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. You have class warfare raging. You have going back into look what's going on in Tunisia and in Egypt. That so-called pro-democracy movement of the Arab Spring has been totally, totally taken over by the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And they were not involved in either of the uprisings that began in those countries over a year ago. And then you look at what's going on in Bahrain. There's a civil war. There's a civil war in Yemen. There's a civil war in Syria, and there's a civil war in Libya. There's a civil war in Mali and other places throughout Africa. This is spreading worldwide. And we believe that the first great war of the 21st century is already underway. And people just aren't adding it all up. One of the politicians, Gerald, that uh, I'm going to miss in the year 2013 is uh, Congressman Ron Paul. He's retiring. Uh, he had some great uh, some great uh, stuff today to say. Uh, he says, stop the drone strikes. Stop meddling in the internal affairs of other nations. Stop accumulating more debt. Respect personal liberty and free markets. And stop bailing out failed but politically connected companies and industries. Boy, there's a good prescription right there. Oh, yeah. And, and think of the last one you just said. Stop bailing out politically connected companies. There are four words that kill capitalism in America. This is not capitalism. Too big to fail. Who made this up? Too big to fail. You mean your buddies got connections and they're not going to let you go down for making bad bets. So let's steal the money from the people. And then he, and Ron Paul is talking about freedom and liberty and constitutional rights. They're being taken away from mm -hmm. us, going into foreign nations, killing innocent people. And these politicians talk about the founding fathers. They'd be turning in their graves if they knew what they were doing. Now, this nation was built on a premise of not getting involved in foreign entanglements. And it's only the politicians and the money junkies that get us into these foreign entanglements because they have a money option in it that they want, whether it was the banana republics for, for the... Uh, for the United Fruit down in, in, in South America, or whether it was Iran, like you mentioned, in 1953, the American government overthrowing the democratically elected government of Mossadegh because he had the nerve to want to nationalize Iranian oil and take it out of the control of Anglo-Iranian oil, better known uh, as yes. BP and Standard Oil. Yeah. So Ron Paul's 100% correct on these issues. Gerald Salente, our guest here on This Week in Money. We have to reserve a special place uh, in our 2013 predictions for the media, or as you call them, and I love this, the prostitutes. Well, look what they're doing. Look what's... I, I mentioned Syria. The American government and the other NATO governments keep coming out with all of these accusations about Syria has chemical weapons and they may use them on their people or they may get in the hands of Al-Qaeda and other bad people that the United States and NATO use when it's ever to their advantage. And without any proof of anything. Mm -hmm. And if you read closely and you watch the language, you find out that it's only speculation. But the prostitutes sell it as fact. And, and they just like they did with the Iraq War and the Afghan War. And then now when you turn on the business media and you see these money honeys that they have, particularly coming out <laughs> of Asia and other countries, yeah. I mean, hawking stocks and, and, and equities, I mean, you know, I, I think they should have, you know, maybe uh, CNBC lap dancing for finance. <laughs> and that's what it's turned into. Yeah, absolutely. These are prostitutes at the most 
base level. Gerald Salente is publisher of the Trends Journal, and he's founder director of the Trends Research Institute. Winter edition of Trends Journal coming out soon. Put your money where your mind is and subscribe. You can get more information at trendsresearch.com. Hey, Gerald, it's great to talk to you. Good to have you back, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay, thanks for having me on, and Happy New Year. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Bob Hoy is Chief Financial Strategist for Institutional Advisors, and Bob writes Pivotal Events, a weekly overview. You can find out more at institutionaladvisors.com. Hey, Bob, it's good to have you back here in 2013 on This Week in Money. Well, it feels like a new year. It does, doesn't it? I think so. thought we'd start off with an overview, figure out how the heck we got here, and where the heck are we going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the um, politics in the U.S. is, of course, dominating everything. And it is brutal. Um, that White House administration is a very, very thuggery bunch. And uh, But, you know, just the way they go about tax issues, uh, I think four or five months ago the House offered a deal by cutting certain write-offs and uh, all that sort of stuff. They mm-hmm. could raise the amount of money that Obama was looking for without having to raise tax rates. So, oh, no, we got to raise tax rates. And the amount uh, they're going to get out of the rich people would probably keep the government going. I saw one number for 12 days. So anyways, it's just pure animosity, hostility, hate those who have it, and it's sad to see. But the other part is that it uh, it's not going to quit. Um, each gain uh, the administration makes, will lead to the next gain. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's ending action on this stuff. The, you've had a hundred years of an experiment in authoritarian government, and this is sort of like an overshoot on a, on a, when a commodity gets too hot or a stock gets too hot, it just gets overdone. And uh, yeah. so the reversal when it comes in politically is going to be fascinating, but maybe later in the year, who knows? Okay, we made it over the fiscal cliff this week, and now we, it's on to the debt ceiling. But I was thinking this morning, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna stick with the Wiley e. Coyote analogies, well, shouldn't it be called the debt canyon? The debt canyon. Well, I thought you said the death. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, you know, um, it could be that sort of a thing. Now, you've had a couple of uh, uh, well, the, the 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 whole political process is just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You've got this situation here where you for the last month or so you've had reasonably buoyant consumer sentiment numbers you got uh opinion polls for obama at 57 percent approval and so at the moment everything seems to be going well you've had uh since early october commodities and stocks have had a good rally so uh, things are looking good at the moment. Speaking of Wally Coyote, here's Alan Kruger. He's chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, says, I think we're really playing with dynamite with the uh, with the debt ceiling. <laughs> He's yeah. the coyote, right? Yeah. Well, then, you know, a few weeks ago, you had Fisher, who was head of the Dallas Fed, saying that the policy of buying bonds is like a Hotel California. <laughs> you You may be able to check out, but you can never leave. That's right. But, uh, so, uh, and then, oh, oh Sla- uh, Lacker, Lasker uh, at the Richmond. Jeff Fed, Lacker, yeah. He was saying that uh, this is getting a bit far. So I think you've had there two instances, and perhaps this third one today, is guys who are professional in the, in the central banking business, and they are getting apprehensive about their own uh, reputation in the future. That, hey, if the wheels come off this thing, I don't want to be seen to have been an earnest part of it. So this is this is a heads up with these, what these guys are saying. Yeah. Anyway, to step outside of the enclosure and start saying things like that, that's... That's very bold. Of course, we had some Fed news uh, just yesterday. The Fed minutes released yesterday. The FOMC split as to whether they're going to keep on uh, just shoveling money out the door through the year. There's obviously uh, some dissent there within the Fed. But, you know, I found a couple of quotes here that, uh, you know, the one uh, here is that uh, the uh, French socialists wanted to raise the tax uh, high up on the rich. And then the French court comes out and says that a 
75% tax rate on the rich is unconstitutional. It fails to ta- to guarantee taxpayer equality. So something going on there. The other mm-hmm. one, there's something really interesting going on, is, is that Cuba has been laying off those working for the government, so the state payroll. And uh, with that, the private sector jobs grew 23% in 2012, so they cut... Uh, government workers by 6%, and you go to 23%. You know, I mean, gosh, yeah. if they cut 12% of the work, government workers, how many, uh, how would employment soar then on the private <laughs> side? But, you know, this business of beating up on class hatred yeah. uh, just because somebody's made more money than the other guy, is it goes back here when I found a piece by Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding uh, signers in the U.S. Constitution, and this was from a letter in 1824, quote, I think myself that we have more machinery of government, that was in 1824, wow. than is necessary. Too many parasites living on the labor <laughs> of the industrious. Perfect. Couldn't say it any better. Bob Hoy from Institutional Advisors, our guest here on This Week in Money. And the other uh, story making news of this week, uh, the mixed job numbers from Canada and the U.S. Canada's unemployment rate dropping to 7% last month, the lowest in four years. Economists expecting way less jobs than were actually created. Meanwhile, in the U.S., uh, unemployment hitting almost 8%. Economists there had expected it to remain unchanged. So economists everywhere uh, are surprised today, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. What a bunch. Let's talk about uh, what's going on in the markets. U.S. markets on track for a pretty good week after they fixed that annoying fiscal cliff problem. Huh? It forced a huge short covering so that you had two 90% up days in a row. That's where 90% of the stock and or our trading were in um, increased volume and stuff like that. So that's a big buying urge. Mm-hmm. And you remember back in early November, we were looking for, well, that was sort of a downer then, but we were kind of looking for stocks and commodities and corporate bonds to generally improve out into uh, January. Well, we're here, and then you had this uh, huge short squeeze, so it's it's up. So what we do now is when uh, the good things have happened into a period when you had a target, kind of looking around for... Uh, signs of overbought, that sort of thing. So we'll be watching it closely for that. But in the commodities, base metals have done reasonably well. You've had a decent rally out of crude oil. But the grains, they just can't get out of their own way. That's Um, interesting. Of course, we'll go back to July when you had a a worst drought in 50 years, and that got all the Malthusian worriers going that, you know, the world was going to run out of food. And then they've been coming down ever since, and it's still a chart on the on the uh, GYX, which uh, no, sorry, it's GKX. The GKX that covers the the agricultural prices is just in a steady stair step decline to actually new lows for the move this week. So that's sort of saying that supply demand is getting better, and that there's not a booming demand for agricultural products, the basic agricultural products. So, and then the the, ra- the recovery in, in base metals is not all that robust either. So we'll just watch and see what these things do over the next week or so. Uh, the um, junk bonds, of course, with a better stock market, have been doing well. But then as we talked, I think, just before, before Christmas, the municipal bond index had got hit pretty hard, and it sort of recovered to uh, a rebound level where it looks like it's gone about far enough. But really of interest here is the the long bond, uh, the long U.S. treasuries, which uh, have been a favorite because various central bankers were buying them. But a couple of weeks ago, this thing uh, broke a uh, 20-month uptrend line. And then the price of the bond came down and then rallied back up, but it, it shied away from that trend line. So it looks like the big infatuation for long treasuries is in the market and gone past. You remember that back in June, we had the upside exhaustion on that, and uh, we're looking for what we call the Eiffel Tower, where it goes straight up one side and then wiggles across the top and then goes down the other side. Well, 
that drama did not happen, mm-hmm. but what you have here is some fairly important legs down in the price of long U.S. Treasuries, and that means those yields are going up. And so we think there's other vulnerability in the bond market. Uh, you've had the, um, the say, for example, in Eurobonds, the Spanish 10-year note, which last July, in the panic of not being able to meet their obligations, the yield soared up to 7.5% as prices plunged. And then since then, actually, all has been well because you've had that bond yield come all the way down to just a bit above 5%. And uh, and looking on the chart back a couple of years, there's lots. Uh, it's been at this 5% level before and stayed there for a while before it soared up to 7%. So we think there's support here. And then the next surprise, perhaps, for Euroland bonds would be rising yields, and that would not be too pleasant over there. Bob Hoy from Institutional Advisors, our guest here on This Week in Money. And let's talk about the corporate bond market. Interesting, a headline from uh, businessweek.com this morning. As credit quality slips, bond investors need to be cautious. Listen to this number, Bob. In 2012, companies around the world issued nearly four trillion dollars in debt. Ooh, yeah. You're getting close to talking about real money. There. That's real money, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as we, uh, for those who have been bond traders for a long time, it has been a GMI market. Get me in. Get me in. Yeah. And they are eventually followed by GMO market. And then GMTHO markets. Get me the hell out of here. <laughs> I thought you might have been coming up yeah. with something a little worse than that, and I was just about ready to hang up. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, where were we going with the bond market this year? What's going on? Well, I think the re- the mania, like as you said, the, something trillions of corporates floated. Now, that takes up a lot of buying power. Sure, the central bankers have been creating uh, credit out of thin air, but that can't go on forever. And then... What you have is you've had a lot of fund managers piggybacking on the on the central bank buying a bond. So you have here, perhaps, let's talk about the U.S. Treasury. Perhaps the guys at the Federal Reserve are saying, we have been reckless. Let's just stop it. Or, or perhaps part of it is that the, the, the fund managers that come in on the play have said, hey, this is good enough. Let's get out. So... Uh, even with a, a, a persuasive authority like the Federal Reserve behind it, you can't get a trend running forever. So, now, anyways, important in the last two weeks breakdown in the long bond price. So let's just uh, watch it. I think it'll signal perhaps problems in in other uh, bond sectors. Okay. Let's talk currencies. What's the U.S. dollar doing today? The U.S. dollar keeps <clears throat> bouncing off that 79. It 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 continues to act reasonably well. We thought that it would come down to, uh, uh, in, in, you know, as you had stocks and commodities and corporate bonds going up in, uh, into January, that we thought the U.S. dollar would come down. But it set a really, a, a, what looked like a pretty good low um, in, in December uh, at that 79 okay. level. Yeah, there's that low in December. And then it was tested here just a couple of days ago, and then now we're back up to this 80.8 level. So the U.S. dollar is not going up, I would suggest, because of any brilliant policy in the U.S. <clears throat> you had this short squeeze rally in the stock market, but you still got problems out there. Yeah. Um, you can no longer say that the dollar is firm because... Uh, the rest of the world is buying long treasuries. Uh, I think maybe this firming of the dollar this week is a little step to saying, guys, watch out. Maybe the risk trade has been far too impetuous. So let's watch it closely. Uh, it bounced off the 79 a couple of times here. And uh, if it takes a serious leg up, uh, that would be 
not due to any great improvements in U.S. political or economic life, but due to perhaps another phase of liquidity concerns coming in. Bob, one of the fun things we get to do each week is uh, look at crazy ideas that come up. Did you know that there's apparently an idea uh, being floated uh, to make a platinum coin, a U.S. platinum coin, worth a trillion dollars and just deposit it at the Fed? That would solve the debt problem. Apparently, the Treasury can do this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I read that one as well, and I think what was proposed is to get around the debt ceiling limit. Some think tank or somebody has got this idea that if you create out of thin air <laughs> a trillion dollar coin, <laughs> then they can use that, I don't know, uh, and not raise the deduction. But it's going to be bullying politics within uh, a couple of months on debt limits and all that, debt ceilings and all that sort of stuff. It's not going to be very pretty at all. Bob Hoy, our guest here on This Week in Money. He works for Institutional Advisors, and you can get more information on uh, what Bob's doing at institutionaladvisors.com. Let's talk gold and silver. A bit of a shock for gold today, down 3%, but it's rebounded. Silver down 4% before pouncing back. And, of course, the uh, Fed minutes released yesterday causing that huge sell-off. Well, the um, yeah, they, well, there was uh, a good rally, and it was in need of correction. And... Uh, They've corrected it all right. That was pretty severe. Mm-hmm. But what we were looking at is we want to go back to um, last September when our measure on the on the uh, silver gold ratio, when the momentum on that thing got so high that it we as we said it was danger danger time. So then the sector would correct and. Um, on that RSI we use on the silver gold ratio, when it gets anywhere above 78, that's dangerous. So last September it got to 84, which was really dangerous. Yeah. Then, then a couple of weeks ago it got below 30. Now below 30 means that a lot of the excitement has been washed out of it, and our advice was to accumulate the gold sector, you know, along with some silvers, and we had a nice rebound, and then now. Uh, it's that low of a couple of weeks ago is, well, at the moment it's taking it out. But our view remains the same, that it takes a while to to get a, a bottom in on on, the, uh, on any any sector when it's ha- having a rough shipping. And um, that one should be accumulating in here. So we've got, like, you've got the GDX, which is the senior golds. That's... Uh, the low uh, a couple of weeks ago was 43.7, and we're down here to 44 and a half. Okay. Uh, it's been at this, let's call it 45 level, 44 level. One, two, three, this would be the fourth time. So, uh, as I say, bottoms take some work. It's a process, and we would stay with accumulating uh, some of your favorite gold and silver stocks. We're talking to Bob Hoy from Institutional Advisors here on This Week in Money. Gold had a pretty good year last year, going up for the uh, 12th straight year, and hard to make predictions, but you can pretty well see what's going on. What's what's the outlook for gold for 2013? What do you think? Well, we kind of like to shift over and look at the, at the real price, which is uh, gold divided by uh, consumer price index or because since the Clinton era, the uh, CPI calculation has been suspect. So we just do it against our own commodity index. And it has been improving uh, for a year and a half. And it's best to explain it, Phil, when, say, crude is outperform or gold is outperforming crude oil. Well, crude represents cost of energy. So if your energy costs are not too high, you're going to be making money. So this is the key for investors in looking at the gold sector is is the real price advancing which is a proxy for operating margins and yeah uh on the law and and also in previous post bubble contractions that's one of the features is that the pricing pressure for most industry and commerce is there there's too much around but then that pricing pressure uh, shows up in the real price of gold advancing, so the uh, gold sector makes money. So we're positive on the long term on the okay. gold sector of any of the sectors that you can analyze uh, in a post bubble contraction. Gold does best. So, you know, there'll be some new high tech stories now and again, sure. but uh, those are not forecastable ahead of time. But the one thing that is 
is the uh, is the improvement in in the real price of gold. So, just to wrap it up, we would be accumulating on weakness some of the your favorite gold stocks. Besides the craziness, ongoing craziness from the Fed in 2013, any other factors that could drive gold either way? What should we be watching for? Well, see if you look at the dollar price which I think is, if people want to trade gold in dollars, that's fine, or Canadian dollars, U.S. dollars, or in sterling, or in euros, that's fine. But it, it doesn't have much to do with investing in gold stocks. So our, our ideal for this year would be to have the gold outperforming most other uh, commodities. Mm-hmm. So the real price is improving. The other one would be that uh, the U.S. dollar may rise in the next onslaught of, of um, difficult times. But if it's not rising too quickly, then it won't upset the uh, the gold sector too much. So, And then when the stock market, uh, the big market in New York, is not under pressure, then the gold shares will do well. So I think this uh, year is, is uh, going to be shaped up pretty good for the gold shares. And... Uh, as compared to other sectors. Are you saying that we're going to see maybe an end to the disconnect between miners and bullion this year, you think? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Because remember back in May when we had that horrendous washout, that's when uh, the uh, you know gold, uh, relative, uh, gold stocks relative to gold, everything got very, very cheap. Now, generally that's been improving, but nothing too, too dramatic yet. I mean... We're not looking at a top in here. <laughs> yeah. We're looking at a bottoming process. Bob Hoy is Chief Financial Strategist for Institutional Advisors. And Bob writes Pivotal Events, a weekly overview. You can find out more at institutionaladvisors.com. We have a cold, foggy, wintry weekend here in Vancouver. What are you going to do, Bob, besides avoid that new bridge? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Nothing's planned yet. Uh and what about yourself? It's kind of a football weekend. It's the uh, last uh, week of, uh, actually, we're in playoffs already. It's the uh, wild card weekend in the oh, NFL. Okay. So I'll be putting on my cheese head and cheering for the Packers, of course. Well, of course. Now, you know, the Seattle Seahawks, mm-hmm. they, they have turned out brilliant. They're doing great. And for decades, I can remember that they always had the nicest looking uniforms. Well, that's and, and you mentioned before, that's that's really how you pick your oh, teams. Oh, yeah, that's how you, and you know. Any any of those football games or whatnot, I can't tell you who who I'm going to support until I see the uh, their uniforms. So. I'm glad we made it off the fiscal cliff, and we're looking forward to a great weekend. And uh, we appreciate uh, <laughs> talking to you more in 2013. Well, always fun. Thanks to our guests, Gerald Salenti and Bob Hoy. And thank you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy for AmericanManganeseInc.com. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.